Good evening, I'm Katerina Georgieva. Here's what's making news right now. At this point, the province has articulated that the priority is to get people vaccinated. Uh, and, and we would encourage people to avail themselves of that opportunity. It's horrible. I mean, uh, boarded up homes in on Bloomfield, on Edison, on Brock, different parts of our community in Sandwich have become normalized. We've never seen a deficit this bad. If we're not able to, to deal with that deficit, um, just as the need for our services and support is increasing, we may be forced to begin scaling back some of those services and supports. Thanks for joining us. Omicron has put Canada and our community on edge. Boosters are being touted as one weapon to defend against this more transmissible variant. Starting tomorrow, anyone 18 or older in Ontario, including in Windsor, Essex, is eligible for a booster shot. The local health unit says the sheer volume of doses required means it'll be leaning on other professionals to help. Our Jason Vio is on this story and joins me now live. Jason, what will this massive rollout look like in our region? Well, one pharmacist I spoke with says it will be controlled chaos. Tim Brady owns pharmacies across Essex County. And right now, before these new booster rules even kick in, he has more than 400 people on a wait list for a shot. That's because of staffing issues at pharmacies, for example, around the holidays. Sometimes they'll be short on the vaccine itself or other times they won't have enough needles. Probably about 30 to 45 seconds after the premier made his announcement, uh, the phones would lit up and uh, went off the hook. So, I mean, he's he's made a statement to say, walk in, just walk in and get your shots. But the reality is the focus for pharmacists is safety of the staff, the ourselves and our patients. And myself, the best way to do that is, is appointment based model. Now, it will be Monday when everyone in Ontario 18 and up can get that booster shot. But as Katerina mentioned, starting tomorrow, some pharmacies and others can start administering the shot in that age group. To help with all of this, the local health unit says it's looking at increasing capacity at the Devonshire Mall vaccination clinic. About 2,000 shots a day are administered there, but they want to boost that number. So they've reassigned staff who normally do contact tracing to assist with that. And as of this morning, local appointments through the health unit's website were booked up until at least December. 28th. We have to be careful how far out we, we book because it is also based on uh, capacity and our supply and ensuring that we are you know ready to go. But um, as I said, we're trying to increase capacity. So you know there may right now everything's booked, but we may be able to add additional appointments on additional days as we add resources. Jason, what else is being done here to ensure that people in Windsor Essex can get a booster in a timely manner? Well, the local health unit has also reached out to primary care physicians, hospitals, and even dentists to help with vaccinations. Now, here's a statement from the Ontario Dental Association on that because we haven't seen this before. While dentists are open to doing uh, what they can to fight COVID-19, there are numerous logistical issues to dentists giving vaccines at dental clinics that would need to be worked out, including permission from the province and the dental regulator, Vaccine storage and tracking, those are all issues that they've outlined before that can be done. I also spoke with one family doctor who says she's been giving out vaccines since May. That's for her patients, their families and some walk-ins. And she says it's been going pretty smooth there. The office orders vaccines based on appointments that are booked and she says she gets everything she needs on time. And it's th three months from the second shot that they can start the third shot. Um, so it's, it's gonna be, I, I think it's gonna be even busier than it has been. We've been averaging about 70 to 80, 70 to 80 and up to like over 100. Dr. Ng says she administers COVID vaccines on weekends, so she has space to see her patients during the week. So she says she's been working seven days a week for much of the pandemic, and Ng says she's tired and feels drained, but feels the need to do what she can to help. Jason, so booster shots are one line of defense, and rapid antigen tests are another, and that's also part of the province's plan to fight this. So how can people get those rapid tests for free leading up to the holidays? Well, as we've reported before, children at schools across Essex County have already been sent home in some cases with these tests to be used over the holidays before potentially returning to school. But also 100 LCBOs across Ontario will distribute these tests. There are two designated ones in Windsor, the LCBO across from Devonshire Mall and the other one at Tecumseh Road East and Lozon. Now kits are limited and given out on a first come first serve basis. Thanks for this, Jason. CBC's Jason Veal live tonight. 
The number of COVID-19 cases in Windsor-Essex continue to push up. Today, another 109 cases added to our community. While boosters are being fast-tracked, there are still about 50,000 people in Windsor-Essex who remain unvaccinated. And today, the Acting Medical Officer of Health had this message for them. People with libertarian objections, suspend them at this point, or at least do it for this year so we can get a better control of this. Meanwhile, new modeling from Ontario's science table suggests the number of people in intensive care could overwhelm the health care system within weeks. Preventing that, they say, will take further restrictions along with a big push to get vaccine shots into arms. Lorenda Redekop has the details. This will likely be the hardest wave of the pandemic. Stark predictions as the science table returned for its first in-person modeling briefing in months. In a worst case scenario, new cases could hit 10,000 a day this weekend. Even with their recommended circuit breaker, limiting contacts to 50%, cases could still rise to almost 5,000 a day by the end of December. They say without any extra measures, there could be more than 600 COVID patients in ICU before the end of the month. But there are still questions about the new variant. Even if Omicron is 25% less severe than Delta, ICU numbers could rise to almost 500. The government says the province is ready for an increase in admissions. It does cause serious disease. Hospital rates have risen in South Africa where it first took hold. It's not just a case of the sniffles. But he says vaccinations alone aren't enough. I believe we can do this without closing schools or shutting down businesses that have suffered during previous waves. But it will take serious restrictions that reduce contacts. The Premier and Cabinet saw this modelling before they approved changes yesterday. So the projections don't take those extra measures into account. Ramping up booster doses, limiting capacity at large venues to 50% and expanding access to rapid tests. Any measures will help reduce, uh, but they're not enough to really uh, curb the rapid growth uh, of the variant. At this Toronto restaurant, they're going further than the province's measures, stopping indoor dining for now, moving to takeout only. I have a, sh a chef who has a one-year-old daughter. If he tests positive today, he has to isolate from his one-year-old daughter over the holidays. I'm a primary caregiver to uh, uh, my mother who requires 24 care, so I'm thinking about that. Last thing I want is to test positive today. She says it's easier for her to quickly implement changes, but would like the province to do more. The government says the chief medical officer will continue to review the data and act as needed to limit transmission and protect Ontarians. Lorenda Radakop, CBC News, Toronto. A new tax on vacant homes is coming to Windsor. It's aimed at getting more houses on the market and clearing up abandoned properties. The CBC's Chris Ensing takes a look at the numbers. Sandwich Town is littered with them, boarded up homes left to rot, most owned by the company that operates the Ambassador Bridge. They're a constant concern for Councillor Fabio Costante and his constituents. What we're looking at right here, how long do you think this house has been abandoned for? 10, 15 plus years. For people who live in this area, you got a neighbor across the street, you got a community over there. What does this mean to the way they live their life? It's horrible. I mean, uh, boarded up homes in on Bloomfield, on Edison, on Brock, different parts of our community in Sandwich have become normalized, uh, and it's it's like significantly deteriorated quality of life. To end what Costante calls an injustice, councils approved a new vacant home tax. Houses left vacant will be billed a percentage of its assessed value. Staff recommend a rate between 1 and 2 percent. That's not a lot of money for these homes here. They would all qualify for this vacant tax. They've been empty for years and you can look at them and see they're not worth much. Property tax records, they say the same. For this stretch of homes on Edison that are abandoned, that tax would add up to $2,000 for the year total. I'm wondering, and this will be subject to the consultation phase, whether or not we could have an escalation of the penalty uh, year over year. So if it remains vacant in year two, it maybe doubles, in year three it triples, etc. Costante says it's not about the money. The idea is to encourage either the, the property owner to sell the property to somebody who's going to live in it uh, or rent it out uh, or encourage the, the property owner to, to actually rent it out at some point. And so, um, you know, w we all know the, the pressures that we have on affordable housing in our community uh, and the limited supply stock. So this, 
you know, helps address uh, that as well. The president of the Windsor Essex County Association of Realtors doesn't think it will help home buyers. Based on the on the uh, information we have, where it is implemented across our country, it uh, it doesn't have an impact on the affordability for for homeowners. Barry says incentives would be a better move, like doubling the current land transfer tax rebate. Costante says the tax is a work in progress. The intent is not to generate revenue for the city. The intent is to activate these homes again. Consultations start early next year. Bills they should be in the mail by the end of 2022. Chris Ensing, CBC News, Windsor. A nonprofit home for refugees in Windsor is going through a financial crisis. Matthew House is currently dealing with a deficit of around $54,000. It's the biggest deficit the organization has ever faced. As CBC's Ashta Shetty reports, the house will need the public's help in order to survive. Matthew House typically receives no government funding. They rely entirely on community donations. On top of that, they say they pay the city about $36,000 in property taxes. Those costs, a recent move to a bigger location, plus the pandemic, have pushed Matthew House into a financial crisis. We've had to, to use donated dollars um, to go to pay for our property taxes, our utilities, um, to, to carry the building costs. Matthew House helps refugee claimants with housing, basic needs, legal aid and employment, amongst many other things. Marenzi says if the centre continues in a deficit, some of these services will be in jeopardy. Olayemi Mapadaroon first arrived at Matthew House just about four months ago. She relies on these services, saying for maybe the first time in her life, Matthew House gave her the opportunity to take care of herself. They give me peace of mind when I nearly came because all the worries of how do I get this done, how do I have access to this, they were there for us. And the peace of mind made me to be able to think straight. So I was able to apply for the colleges, for the universities, every, you know, to get things in process. There's currently 68 men, women and children living here. And while the center does need money, they also need larger pots and pans, mattresses and comforters, dish and laundry soap and really any other essentials community members can donate. Ashta Shetty, CBC News, Windsor. The town of Lakeshore is telling residents not to dump yard waste at a local park in the Russell Woods area. A few days ago, residents started dumping dozens of bags of waste in the parking lot of Leffler Peace Park. It forced the town to spend hundreds of dollars to have their garbage contractor take it away. And CBC News found more bags there today, along with some other garbage. This is the area where residents usually dump Christmas trees, but that has not started yet. The the town's yard waste pickup days ended two weeks ago for the season. Town officials aren't sure why people have been dumping their yard waste there, but the warm weather might have something to do with it. I'm not sure if it was uh, miscommunication or if it was uh, one resident started it and then, you know, the next one thought, oh, here's a spot to drop off our yard waste. Unfortunately for us, uh, this year, with how warm it's been, the, trees, the leaves have dropped late and uh, residents are dealing with the leaves now. The town is urging residents to take their yard waste to the transfer stations in either Kingsville or in Windsor. Lakeshore is shifting the yard waste pickup next year to start later and end in December. The Christmas tree drop off this year will start after Christmas and finish at the end of January. Wild weather has been lashing across North America for several weeks now. Flooding in British Columbia and on the East Coast. Tornadoes in the southern U.S. and wicked winds in the Midwest. This dash cam video was captured by a Nebraska state trooper near Lincoln. The tractor trailer was one of several that tipped over in extreme winds. The driver was not hurt. The U.S. National Weather Service registered a record number of hurricane force wind gusts yesterday. There were more than 55 gusts that topped 120 kilometers per hour across the Midwest. 
And the devastation in the southern U.S. states by tornadoes last weekend prompted one Windsor man to honor the victims. He has fashioned a display on his front lawn, offering thoughts and prayers for the people who have had their Christmas taken away. Dale Molnar has more. I got plywood, pipe strapping, just some these flags here. They're like three, uh, three something at the dollar store now, or just candy store. When Jerry St. Ange saw the news reports about the devastating tornadoes last weekend, he knew he had to act. So he went shopping for some flags and Bristol board, hammered together some wood and made this display. The handwritten sign reads in part, our thoughts and prayers are with you all from our neighborhood at this time. I was out doing Christmas decorating and don't watch TV as much, but then when I went in and saw the news, it just kind of like hit home. I got a friend, a family member in the state side, but not where they're at, but they're border with us, so they're our neighbors, so it was heartfelt. Like, it's pretty sad to have a tornado come by and just rip everything apart. The sign is right by the bus stop, so a number of passers-by have been moved when they've seen it. Oh, it brought tears to my eyes, you know, that someone in Canada, you know, has a heart and wants to share their compassion for the people across the border. I think that's great that they're supporting the, the, the uh, uh, what happened in the States there from the uh, tornadoes. I, I, I've seen it the other night and I couldn't even believe the devastation. St. Ange's Christmas spirit has rubbed off on his neighbours who are also sympathetic. These devastating things are happening regardless of Christmas. They don't stop because of Christmas and I think it's still a good reminder to come together as a community to help each other out. I kind of feel heartbroken. Really did. Like people, Christmas time's coming and you're, not, you're looking forward to seeing a family member and they're no longer going to be there because the tornado just came and like took their lives. It's, it's pretty bad. I couldn't imagine what the families are going through, but unfortunately we're having Christmas and there's families out there that are probably not having Christmas and, you know, having families taken from you. It's, it's pretty sad. St. Ange has posted his tribute on social media, but doesn't know if the message has been seen by the victims. He expects to keep the display up past Christmas. Dale Molnar, CBC News, Windsor. Love seeing that support in our community. Let's take a live look outside there. Today we had some gorgeous sun this afternoon, 14 degrees if you can believe it. We do have a special weather statement in effect, those strong winds in our area. So we'll take a close look with Nick Serkovich right after the break. Hi, this is Sarah Van Grinsven here at the River Lights Winter Festival in Amherstburg. Tis the season for giving, and that's where the CBC's Sounds of the Season annual food drive comes in. Please visit cbc.ca slash Windsor to donate today.
Nick Sirkovich is here now for a look at our weather forecast. Nick, another day of strong winds. Strong winds, that's right, and also warm temperatures as well. This all associated with a Colorado low that's pushing through the region. Now, earlier today, we saw temperatures in the mid to high teens across southern Ontario. Winds are off the record by 0.1, the, uh, the record 15, the temperature today 14.9. So very close to that record. Special weather statements in effect for wind gusts close to 90 kilometers per hour. We've seen that. Windsor reporting gusts up to about 78 kilometers per hour. And as come with some cloud cover, we've seen a few spotty showers, but this is the front that's moving through and it's going to drag temperatures down moving through the next 24. So tonight, look for clearing sky cover. Still pretty gusty though through the overnight period. Into tomorrow, sunshine clouding over by the late day there. And then we're watching this. Another system moving through and that's going to bring with it some snowfall and potentially a bit of a rain snow mix for Saturday. So a messy mix uh, for all of southern Ontario here. Now, how much can you expect with this? Generally speaking, this system looking at about five to 10 centimeters of snow across southern Ontario. Windsor though, kind of right on the edge. So we may see a little bit of mixed precipitation in there, but generally this is what you can expect, at least with the uh, latest forecast guidance. Wind wise, we're gonna see the winds begin to taper off as we move through the overnight period tonight. This is tomorrow morning. And then as we head through the afternoon, much lighter winds in the forecast. So still looking at gusty or breezy conditions into the overnight and then tapering off uh, as we head through tomorrow afternoon. Speaking of tomorrow afternoon, cooler, five degrees for Windsor, four down toward Leamington. So again, shaving about 10 degrees off what we saw today. And uh, it gets even colder heading into the long range forecast. There's a look at your forecast into Saturday, a bit of a messy mix at zero degrees. And then next week, not doing much better than about one or two, Katarina. At least a nice Friday to look forward to. Thanks for this, Nick. You bet. When we come back, as inflation spikes, we take a look at a critical link in the supply chain that's become a big issue. That's right after the break.
Inflation is spiking here and around the world. A key reason for the price increases is supply chain bottlenecks that make it hard for manufacturers and distributors to meet consumer demand. And there's a critical link in the supply chain that has become a major problem, shipping containers. As CBC's Zach Gowdy explains, there just aren't enough of them, and it's a problem that won't be resolved anytime soon. All goods globally, all travel by shipping containers. It's a web of supply and demand around the globe, and these ship containers go to one spot that has demand, and then that gets filled with supply that needs to go to another place with demand. But that web of supply and demand is being stretched and broken. Now these big metal boxes are at the center of a global crisis hitting large corporations and small family-run furniture stores. I've seen so many of them come into the harbor here on the boats, and you never think there's a shortage. That shortage is yet another consequence of the COVID-19 pandemic, a crisis within a crisis. But even if the pandemic ended tomorrow, the problems with shipping containers wouldn't end with it. From what we're seeing, it could take uh, you know, a couple years before we even get back to any normalcy. One company that knows what normal used to look like is P.F. Collins, founded in 1921 by Patrick Francis Collins, a customs broker in St. John's. In October 2020, it cost about 3,800 U.S. dollars to ship a container from China to the west coast of North America. By October of this year, the price had risen to more than $17,000. It's sitting at more than $14,000 today. There's just been a general increase in demand on these containers, and they haven't, uh, haven't been able to fill in with the supply. As rich countries opened up, demand for goods went up too. That drove up demand for shipping containers and for space on the ships those containers travel in and for space at the ports where the ships are unloaded. Suddenly, the whole system was backed up. Because the ports are backed up, they can't load the empty containers back onto the ships. So the containers aren't getting back to the beginning of the supply chain, pushing demand for the containers that remain even higher. At the end of this strained supply chain is a place like Osmond's Furniture, another family-owned business with a long history in St. John's. I wake up almost every uh, day, every week, to a new price list, uh, a new notice from the suppliers as well, whether it be, uh, you know, the, the containers um, have gone up. Companies like Osmond's and P.F. Collins do what they can to take the hits by absorbing some costs, by dropping some parts of their business altogether. But the problems are stacking up, one shipping container at a time. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. Talk about not wanting Rudolph to join in any reindeer games. A BC woman puts an archery target with a red bulb attached to its nose on her front lawn for the holidays. But a local buck was not impressed and made that pretty clear. And apparently this happens every year. So Rudolph is not getting a warm welcome from his furry relatives. And that is it for CBC Windsor News. For news anytime, go to our website, cbc.ca slash Windsor. And that's where you can also find more information about our Sounds of the Season campaign. Our annual charity drive, all proceeds go to local food banks. So we appreciate your support so much. Thanks for watching. Have a great night.